Please turn to the book of John, chapter 13. And I think I can get through these first 20 verses, although, again, there's so much packed into the book of John. And as you're turning, let me just relate this. In uh, chapter 5 of the famous novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, Miss Maudie tells Scout that the reason that Boo Radley, or Arthur, as she insists call him, the reason he stays at home is that his father is a foot-washing Baptist. Now, have you ever heard of a foot-washing Baptist? <laughs> have you ever heard of a hard-shell Baptist? They're delicious, you just, no. <laughs> According to Miss Maudie, a foot washer believes that anything that is pleasure is sin. She says that some of them had told her that, quote, my flowers are going to hell because she spent more time admiring them in the garden than inside reading her Bible. Well, all that to say, they're there's this group called Primitive Baptists or Hard Shell Baptists. They actually practice foot washing as an ordinance. Now, I don't believe that foot washing is an ordinance in the church, but of course, the meaning behind foot washing, absolutely yes. And in this text this morning, Jesus demonstrates his love for his own by setting an example for them that is just impossible to miss. So let's read our text this morning and then we'll dive in. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. So when he'd washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I sent receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. So this is all happening now on Thursday evening during Passover. All of the events that will follow his betrayal in the garden, his trial, his flogging, his crucifixion, these are all preceded by this tender, intimate period of Passover celebration between Jesus and his closest friends. We know it as the Last Supper. Chapters 13 through 16 
where Jesus dialogues with the disciples. And then chapter 17, what we call Christ's high priestly prayer. And this is, in a sense, the passing of a baton. It's the moment where Jesus is preparing his own servants to go out and serve, minister. It's what the word minister means, to minister the word of God. And remember how many times Jesus has emphasized to us that he was sent. I was sent by the Father. Well, now he's going to send. And they're being sort of finalized in their training as ambassadors for Jesus. So what kind of a person is fit to be an ambassador of Jesus? Who is fit for this mission? Who can stand? Well, it's the kind who has the attitude of the Lord Jesus himself. We're going to concentrate here in the next few minutes, three characters, three persons. Of course, number one, the Lord Jesus himself, Judas and Peter. And we're going to see how these serve as examples to us today. Well, first, we see Jesus. Notice this. Jesus is utterly self-aware on a number of points. Verse 1, he knew that his hour had finally come. Just by way of reminder, so many times in the book of John, his, his hour had not yet come. My hour is not yet here. Now it is. This is it. He knew that his hour had finally come. He knew those who were his own. Verse 3, he knew that he had come from the Father and was soon to be returning to his Father. Another one, he knew that the Father had entrusted or given all things into his hands. And he also knew who, who really were his true disciples and who wasn't. And here it says that Jesus loved his own to the end, not meaning that his love for the world is diminished or in view here, but this is the specific intentional love that Christ has for his own. In this case, his closest friends, his disciples. And I often think of the example that if someone says God has to, he's obligated to love every human being exactly in the same way, I say, well, that means I have capacity to love that God doesn't. You see, I can have brotherly love for my sisters in the Lord, but that's not the same as the love I have for this sister in the Lord, my wife. She's my bride. I have a special, intentional love for her. And I hope my love beautifies my wife. Oh God, that's my goal. <laughs> so how does Jesus love his own? Well, he models something that we are all, as Christ's people, to emulate. He serves. And this is what I think this text is really about, if you're going to have a hook to hang your coat on here. I don't know where that comes from. The center is that if you're going to represent Jesus in this world that we live in, you have to have this humility about you. It's about others. It's not about you. It isn't about being served, but joyfully serving God by serving others. And if Jesus does it, then of course we should too. There is, a, there is kind of a a, a quick on the surface meaning to this text, but there's also much that is baked in, and I hope to draw that out this morning. Remember our context. They're in a borrowed room. This is not their own place. So there would have to be some preparations to be made. We hear that from the, from the synoptic gospels. Go do this and that and get everything ready for the supper. And traveling means lots and lots of walking. In the first century... Everybody had to walk where they were going, and everybody wore sandals, so your feet are exposed to all the crud and grime and whatever donkeys and oxen and cattle leave in the streets. You're, you're subject to that. And when you ate, you would be reclining. So it wouldn't be like we're going to do later where we have our feet under the table, as you have to remind your kids, get your feet under the table. Come on, we're civilized. No, in those days, their feet would have been kind of up and elevated. And, and so feet were kind of a big deal. 
And the practice during the first century was for the lowest of the house slaves, the lower class servants would be the ones who washed the feet of all the guests at a feast. And so it would not normally be necessary for Jesus to wash the disciples' feet because they had already been washed by a servant when they entered the upper room. But there were no servants. We don't, there's no record of this. They borrowed the room. They didn't borrow any of the household slaves. And Jesus' choice to wash their feet is to serve and make an example of the most extreme, humble service towards others. Do you remember John the Baptist when he was proclaiming Jesus way back in the first couple chapters of John. He said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals, let alone anything else. I'm the, compared to Jesus, zero. And this must have been strange for the disciples because just days earlier, do you remember what their discussion was about? Well, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? And somebody's mom gets involved. And it's just ugly, you know. Typical. Well, my son is got the degree, you know. Instead of looking out for each other, they're comparing and competing and trying to get the upper hand. F. B. Meyer says this: the Synoptic Gospels tell us that on their way to the feast, the disciples had yielded to contention and pride. So would we. Let's not get too carried away. And it was needful that these should be put away. Contention and pride. For our, lo our Lord's love was equal to the occasion. Here's how he loved him. He loved them to the end of his life and to the end of love. Only such love could have made saints and apostles out of such material. <laughs> Same thing for you and I. Only God's grace and mercy and love can make saints out of rebels. To be sure, this passage emphasizes inner humility that's manifested in a real practical way in practical service but not in a physical right that the church is supposed to be doing back to our foot washing baptist example from harper what's her name harper lee yeah our granddaughter is named elise harper bore and i think it was only tommy who now we're not naming her harper hannah <laughs> So this is a little personal. Why don't I think that this should be an, ord an ordinance in the church? There were many Baptists gone before us that do it. Some people still do it. In fact, uh, I believe Monday, Thursday, we don't do the church calendar here, but that's a time where they also do this to emulate Christ and the apostles. Well, remember in 1 Timothy 5.10, a Christian widow who has washed the feet of the saints is a widow indeed, as Paul says. Um, that's not speaking of a right in the church. That's speaking of her service to others. It's her humble, servant-like service to other believers. And remember back in verse 2, there's what we may call a parenthetic statement, a parenthesis. We'll come back to it, but it's where G Judas is first mentioned. Now, we, we've said before that the name of Judas is used as, a, as an adjective of someone who's a betrayer. 30 pieces of silver is often, in our, still in our common parlance, used to describe the, the price of betrayal. It, it's, everyone knows this. Well, here in this text, he's first mentioned, and it's significant to what I believe the rest of this lesson is from the narrative. It's a, it's a time reference. It lets us know that Jesus is doing what he's doing even when he knows that Judas is no longer his friend. By the way, Judas does get his feet washed. It does, there's no exclusion. So Jesus knows who's going to betray him, and yet he continues to serve. Yeah, Judas has already sold out Judas, Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Remember, who was the most put out, offended, by Mary anointing Jesus. It was the money keeper. It was Judas. Well, this could have been sold for the poor. You know, t typical almost of a person who's concerned with earthly things, not with real spiritual truths. I don't know if we can make too much of an analogy today, but 
you know, oftentimes I, I just heard over over our week we visited with some friends. His son happens to work in a really big church in L.A. And uh, they have all these staff people that are basically in charge of media. And my Pharisee inside my heart jumped up for a second and said, well, why are you paying all those? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't go there. But oftentimes that's the response of those. Well, it could have been done. You could have served the poor. Yeah. Once or twice. Okay. So what he's doing is preparing these men who will primarily be the ones who inaugurate this new community, this messianic community in the world. The, the Jews have rejected him at this point. Not only have they rejected him, but they're violently opposed to him and his purpose. And so Jesus is getting them ready. He has to cleanse them both literally and figuratively by washing their feet and by removing Judas out of the group that's going to be sent. He's not going to send Judas. He's only going to send those who are really his disciples. In fact, jump down to verse 20. Truly, truly, again, when we see this connected, verily, verily, truly, this is important. Amen, amen. I say to you, he who receives whomever, who, whomever I send receives me. So there's that apostle or disciple, apostle as the sent one, a representative of Jesus. And he who receives me receives him, him who sent me. In other words, it's all part and parcel of one thing. You can never have someone come up to you and say, well, I, I believe in the red letters, but not the, not the rest. Well, you, you either take it all or nothing. You can't just take the red letters. And by the way, if you take the red letters, that means you got to take the rest of the book too. No, it's the apostles. They're the ones who were sent out. And by the way, all, all martyred but John. So he wouldn't say this with Judas as one of the group because he's unqualified. He's not his own. Jesus does what he does here knowing that he has the highest rank of anyone. Anyone. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, there is no one who can compare with Jesus in his kingly authority. Now here he's preparing for the ultimate humiliation of going to the cross. But see, we're on this side of eternity. We, we know the story. We know how it ends, too, because God has told us. There is no one that's even close to his station. There's a beautiful picture here, too, of Christ's humility and self-sacrifice in how he goes about foot washing. I, I had never noticed this before. We always refer to Philippians 2 as that wonderful, it's called the hymn to Christ, the Carmen Christi, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, and on and on. How this is portrayed here in Jesus' foot washing. Let's, let me give you some examples. So first, he, he gets up in the middle of the meal. Why? Well, usually, as I said before, feet were washed before anything happened. Even before you came into the room, he interrupts this meat and drink in order to, in order to do his Father's will. Do you remember what Jesus said back in John 4? He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So I was thinking of this, how it, how it really ties into Philippians 2. In Philippians 2, 3, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. So that sets the stage. Now, Jesus isn't thinking my disciples are more important than me. This, this here is to say you as Christians should follow the example of Jesus. I mean, Romans 12 says, don't be unwilling to associate with people of, of low position or to do menial work. Oftentimes, I, I think that some, in some contexts, the professional minister has soft hands. He doesn't know what it means to work like a man works, 
Sometimes. I, I, again, I'm not throwing people under the bus. I understand. You, you grew up in church, feel the call of ministry, go to seminary, pastor a church. But men work. How do, you, how do I relate to men that work? Well, I'm, I work too. That's how <laughs> it helps. But with humility of mind, regard one another. First, he lays aside his garments. Uh, the ESV says he lays aside his outer garments. Probably his tunic, which we know from John 19 was seamless and probably pretty valuable. I think here we can see this symbolizes his laying aside of some of his privileges of, of glory in his incarnation. Philippians 2.6 says, who, although he existed in the form of God, morphe theos, that means he is God, he did not re re uh, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He, so he lays aside his outer garments. Then he takes a towel and he girds himself. Remember the song we sing, Christ will gird himself and serve us. It's all about the final penultimate ultimate supper. But there, he girds himself, and it would have been like a, a linen garment, but it's the kind of garment that a menial slave would put on. In fact, they would always be ready to, to serve, and this garment is one that is also used as a kind of a dish rag towel. It's not, it's not anything really... Great. Philippians 2, 7, taking the form of a bondservant. Even that's being pictured here. And then he pours water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with this towel with which he was girded. So what's, what's significant about the pouring of water? I'm not, I'm not saying this is absolutely what John intended, but I think Scripture being what it is, systematic theology but being what it is, it, it all ties together, it all points back to, as Mark said this morning, what's, the, what's God's plan of redemption? He's going, to, he's going to substitute for you because of his grace. And Paul speaks of being poured out like a drink offering, even later on in Philippians 2, but I think this is symbolic of the blood of Christ poured out for sinners. It says in Revela Revelation 7.14 that this, the saints washed their robes and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb. And this whole picture is the opposite. Just think of this. It's the opposite of what the world thinks a person that is of the highest station should be about. Their version of greatness is that you kick back and you are served. Waiter, this steak is overdone. Bring me another. Making demands on those beneath you. As Jesus said, those those Gentile authority figures like to lord it over. They like you to remember, just remember, I'm the one with the badge, or I'm the one with the degree, or I'm the one with the office. But no, this is not how Christ's ambassadors. In fact, uh, cool word alert, it is the antithesis of what the world thinks. The opposite of truth. If someone's going to have authority and have preeminence in the kingdom of God, then they must emulate Jesus. They must be, able, be not only willing, but able to do what Jesus is doing here. So maybe that's what Peter has in mind. You know, Peter has this reputation as being the firebrand and talking before he thinks. And so this is almost typical Peter. He says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Verse 6. It literally, my feet you wash? What? And Jesus says, I, you don't get it yet. You don't realize now, but you will understand afterwards. Well, Peter begins to dictate to Jesus. Here, I'm going to set the terms. Remember, earlier on, Peter said, you know, you, you can't go to Jerusalem and you shouldn't do that because they're going to, and Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. Peter's just out with it. He, sometimes when I read stuff about Peter, I think, well, that's, that's kind of you, Tim. You know, Sometimes you don't really 
think through things and you forget the proverb, he who answers a matter before, <laughs> right? Uh. And Peter says, you will never wash my feet. Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. That, that means you, you won't inherit the kingdom. You don't go to heaven. And Peter says to him then, well, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Now, this is just remarkable. It's amazing. One moment we find Peter saying, no, he's refusing to allow the master to do such servile work as he's about to do. Lord, you wash my feet never. And the very next second, we find him rushing with characteristic impetuosity into the other extreme. He's just impetuous. He just, okay, whole bath then. And throughout this transaction, we find Peter unable to take in what's going on. He doesn't understand it. The real meaning of what his eyes can see, he just doesn't understand. And, and Jesus said to him in verse 10, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. See what Jesus does here. He's taking the physical, making spiritual application. For he knew the one who was betraying him, and this, for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. At first glance, this may be a little difficult, but Jesus is making a point here, a clear point. Clean, in one sense, means your feet are washed. In another sense, it means morally clean, ethically clean, cleansed of sin. If you are one of Christ's, if you are a believer, then you are clean. You have bathed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Indeed, clothed yourself with the robes dipped in the blood of the Lamb. And God looks at you through the lens, as it were, of his Son in, as you are united to Jesus and his perfect righteousness. But think of this. We all still walk in the world, don't we? We all still have to live in this world. We all get dirty from the filth of this world. Our spiritual feet still get dirty. And it's hard to walk anywhere and not have some dirt and dust and crud stick to you. And mostly because we walk right into the dirt and the crud and the dust. Remember how Paul uses the, the, the metaphor of walking for your comporting yourself in this life. You're moving around in, from place to place and just living in the world. Ephesians 5, 15, or yeah, 5, 15 and 16. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time. Be careful how you walk. The days are evil. So yes, even those who have been clean, justified for 40 or 50 years, still sin and need regular washing by Jesus. That's that's what this same apostle writes later on in, his, in 1 John 1, 6 through 8. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, there's the metaphor again, we lie and do not practice the truth. That, that idea of walking in darkness means when you make the practice continuing to walk in darkness. So that means you don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And again, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. What was Peter's mistake here? He failed to realize that even though he was completely clean, verse 10, that is, even though he was justified in Jesus, there were still sins and issues that needed to be taken care of and cleansed daily confession. We could say daily spiritual foot washing. Jesus has made this, it's not a jump. He's saying this kind of cleanliness to be clean is because of me and what I have done. And now I'm going to further clean. So verse 12, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? 
It's a great question, and, and no one offers an answer, do they? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yeah, this is big time. Jesus knows. He's keenly aware. You call me Lord. You are right. You're absolutely right. There, there's no false humility here. That would be a lie. But this is one of those greater to lesser. If it's true for this person, then how much more would it be true for these people, these persons? If the king of glory can stoop down and do this most menial of tasks, then how much more you, his followers, be willing to serve others? Verse 15, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one sent greater than the one who sent, sent him. Now see, he's making an allusion there again. He's not, he's not greater than his father. He and the father are one. And the apostles aren't greater than Jesus. But both are in the sense being sent. Jesus was sent to accomplish his work. And now the apostles, they haven't been sent yet, but they're going to be. They're going to conquer the world, by the way. That's all it is. It's not pinky in the brain. It's much greater than that. World domination under the benevolent rule of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. But then he says this in verse 17, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Now, the, the word bless or blessing, it really, it, it's kind of, doesn't really, it, this, the blow has been softened. Um, by the way, if you know these things and put them into practice, you are blessed. Well, that doesn't hit us as hard as I think it hit the apostles. The Southern Dictionary uses this word blessed to soften the blow of an upcoming insult. Did you know that? It's common practice. Well, bless her heart, she has no fashion sense at all. <laughs> bless his heart, he couldn't fix a rubber duck. Well, blessing is, is the best. It's joy and favor and contentment and peace with God. It's blessing. It's the opposite. Read, read Deuteronomy. This is blessing, and here's its opposite, cursing. Blessed and cursed. You obey Jesus, you'll be blessed. If, if you don't, no. To be blessed was the absolute height of the situation if you were a Jew. And it is for us as Christians. So if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. That's, that's that joyful contentment in Christ. Verse 18, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. I'll tell you right now, if, if, if I would have been any of the disciples sitting around that table, I'd have, I'd have been freaking out. <laughs> but... It is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives, again, verse 20, whoever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Here's another proof, as if they needed any more of Christ's full deity. And by the way, the word in verse 19, the word he isn't actually there. It's, it's used as a clarifier, but if you have the New American Standard, you'll see it's in italics. Some other versions may have that. It's really just as Jesus used the phrase in John 8, 58, before Abraham was born, I am. And this is so that you may believe that I am, ego a me in the Greek, it's it's the divine name. It's the Exodus 3.14. Who should I tell the people that sent me? And God speaks out of the burning bush and says, tell them I am that I am. And here's the kicker. This is where it all kind of comes together. Peter 
Don't walk like Judas because Judas isn't clean. The 11 are clean, but not Judas. So for Peter, for you, for I, for anyone who's going to represent Jesus in the world, our posture and our attitude, our own sense of who we are in the, in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, must be one of humility that is marked out by humility towards other people. Let me close with this. We are taught here that Christians must never be ashamed of doing anything that Jesus has commanded us to do. We, we must never, never be ashamed of anything that Jesus said. As our buddy Doug Wilson said, we cannot have any problem passages. Anything that God has spoken and revealed, we can't be ashamed of. And especially when Jesus says, here's the example, walk in it. We must never be ashamed of walking in that example. In verse 16, truly, truly, a slave not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent. J.C. Ryle, the famous Anglican from the late 19th century, writes this, There seems little doubt that our Lord's all-seeing eye saw a rising unwillingness in the minds of the apostles to do such menial things as they had just seen him do, puffed up with their old... Jewish expectation of thrones and kingdoms, secretly self-satisfied with their own position as Jesus' friends, these poor Galileans were startled at the idea of washing people's feet. They could not bring themselves to believe that the Messiah's service entailed work like this. They could not yet take in the grand truth that true Christian greatness consists in doing good to others. And hence they needed our words, our Lord's word of warning. If he had humbled himself to do humbling work, his disciples must not hesitate to do the same. So the title of the sermon, how he loved them to the end. How did Jesus love them to the end? Well, back to verse one, he knew that his hour was come. His purpose, as, as we we read in John 12, for this very reason, for this very purpose, I came. He's about to lay his life down for his people. His hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus doesn't, doesn't give us another extended lecture from a pulpit. He demonstrates he shows them. He's, he's, he's told them the way of life. He's about to make wonderful, precious promises to his disciples, but he starts by showing them and demonstrating. He doesn't just make some kind of doctrinal pronouncement. This is what we would do. We would say, well, the answer is, no, he fleshes it out for them to see. He doesn't just talk about righteousness. He lives and exemplifies righteousness. And my friends, he bids us to do the same. Not just to hold doctrine up here in a hermetically sealed compartment, but to put it into practice, to love, serve others. Now I know most of us in this room are older, a bit older, you know, on that side of middle age. But your closest neighbors are usually those people you live with. <laughs> and love your neighbor. And I would often encourage anyone who's, who's a head of a household, love your family, exemplify what it means to, to be a Christian. So most of us are still working. We have people that see us, observe us. They can watch how we walk. We'll do this in a way that is as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Not, not just giving an example, but be willing to talk, to proclaim what God has said. And see, it all kind of goes together. They see that you're not a jerk and you're not a hypocrite. And the words you just told me, I don't know if I like or not, but I like the person giving them. So maybe I'll listen. God uses all of these means as 
as an end to his bringing people into his kingdom. Jesus bids us wash one another's feet. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this incredible salvation purchased the infinite price of the blood of your son. And we thank you for the example. We know the cross isn't merely an example, but actually turns away your anger towards us and removes the reason for the anger in the first place, our guilt of sin. And yet you've given us such clarity in the example of the Lord Jesus in being willing to do the most menial task and to do so in service to others. Lord, help us to have this attitude, this one of humility. We love you and we thank you. We worship you alone. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.